To Psalms chapter 46. Psalms chapter 46 will be in verses 1 through 10 this morning. Psalms 46, verse 1. Those that are able, if you'll stand with me in reverence to the reading of God's holy, infallible, His inerrant, His preserved word that we hold in our hands. Aren't you glad that the Word of God's preserved for you? I don't have to wonder what God thought or what He wrote down. I've got it right here in, uh, in my Bible. Um, and I can hear His voice this morning uh, through His Word. He can hear mine through prayer. We look at Psalms 46 and verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very help in, in present help in time of trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and, uh, and be troubled through the mountains' sake, sh- though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, Selah. Verse 4, there is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her in that right early mood. He uttered uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Verse 8. Come, behold the works of the Lord. What desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in in the fire. Uh, Verse 10, and this is the main verse that we would like to gather this morning. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted among the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Let us pray. Holy God, we come to you through the Son, Jesus Christ. We pray in the power and unction of the Holy Spirit of God. God, we realize and acknowledge that this is your holy written word. We acknowledge this morning, Lord, that we need you. You are infallible. You are, are, uh, God, infinite. We are finite. We are incapable without you. God, show us something in your word today. Move us closer to you, dear God. God, where there is infirmities, where there is sin in our lives, God, cleanse us this morning. Draw us close to you that we may have a greater presence of the Holy Spirit of God in our lives. It's in Jesus Christ's holy and precious name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. This morning as we look at Psalms 46 and verse 10 for the most part, I guess I would uh, entitle the message, if I had a title, I'd say, Slow Down. Uh, Slow Down. Uh, You know this hustle bustle life we're in, uh, Brother Don and... I saw his birth date the other day. I won't call what that was. Um, but nonetheless, I said, you know, those were good years, weren't they, when you were born? And they were slower years. Uh, but today's fast-paced world that we live in today is just, uh, it's like a whirlwind. Uh, we've got so much to do, so much to go, so always something to do. And the whole world is pulling for our attention, isn't it? Uh, but it's times at Christmas where we really begin to see that, when we begin to feel even more pressure in life to, to be at meetings, to be at, at uh, fellowships, to get gifts, to prepare for the upcoming new year. 
But friend, I want to tell you today, I think the scriptures just tell us for the Christian, just slow down. We look here and we see in verse 10, it says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. That word heathen, you could say nation. Because outside of the context of Israel, every other nation other than Israel at that time was heathens. Uh, they weren't God's people. I will be exalted on the, uh, in the earth. So he'll be among, uh, exalted among the nations. He'll be exalted among the earth. Uh, what was God saying? He was saying to the children of Israel in the context, this is talking about Israel who was God's people in the Old Testament. And God worked around that nation. And what did he do? He glorified himself through the people of Israel. It was Abraham's descendants. He brought them out of slavery. He, he, he parted sea, red seas for them. He did great miracles. He fed them in the wilderness. For 40 years they walked in the wilderness and their clothes and shoes never wore out. The miracle of God, the provision for his people. But not only is that the immediate context of this verse, but also uh, the, uh, the broader context is that for you and me, the church today, New Testament believers, that God is with us and God will be exalted through our lives. Through our ups and through our downs, God has made the promise here. He said, I will be exalted. And whether you're going through a low time in life or maybe you're on a high hill right now, maybe you're mediocre right now and you're just scared to say anything because everything's all right right now, but you, you don't want to fall off the side of the cliff and fall into a, a dead or a problem. And This fits everybody that God is going to be exalted in our lives. In verse 11, it says, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. He's talking about the God of their forefathers. Jacob was a descendant of the bloodline that would eventually be Jesus Christ. We saw Abraham, and the righteous line, and saw Isaac. And then Isaac had Jacob. And Jacob, these forefathers, they're acknowledging who their God is. He's the God of the Lord Jesus Christ today. And he is the one and the only true God. And only by Him and access through Him is through His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father except through me. Uh, what does He say here in verse 11? It's acknowledging that God is going to be exalted. Did you see here in verse 10? Then in verse 11, He said, the God of Jacob is with us. Now here's the thing. God is going to receive glory in every person's life. God will be glorified, whether saved or unsaved. Did you know that here in verse 10 it's saying that he's going to be exalted among the heathen. Those were unbelievers. Those were people that didn't follow God, the nations. God is going to be glorified in, in the sinful and the lost nations and lost people and he's going to be glorified in his people, the saved, the redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. God is going to be exalted. It would be kind of like a fight. Uh, let's just say boxing. For today, many of you young guys, you like UFC fighting where they take your elbow and, and twist it around your neck and pop your bones and uh, you get paid good money for it. Um, I think I would just rather not. I'd rather be a baseball player. That's about the safest sport I know of if I could be a professional athlete. But nonetheless, you think about uh, a fighting ring and you think about a boxer and there's going to be one boxer that's going to be glorified because he's going to win the fight. And everybody that is with him is going to glory in him, aren't they? Because, man, it'll be like y'all NFL uh, uh, fans. I hear them talking on Monday and Tuesday mornings talking about, we did this and we did that. And I look over there and I said, we? I said, you ain't throw no football yesterday. What did you do? They're just glorying in what somebody else done because they're on the right side. Here, one boxer's going to win and everybody with him is going to glory. But there's going to be one that's going to get knocked out. That's a, that's Pride. That's a man. That's that's a hurt and a pride in it for a man getting knocked out in front of millions of people, especially. One's going to get beat, but at the same time, he is going to, in some way, bring part of the glorification of the one who won. Because if he had not come to the fight, the other fighter that won could not have any glory, right? And everybody that's tied in with him, even though they despise the other side and the other team, they were still a part of the glory of the one who won. Because they came and they were part of it. Friend, here I'm telling you today that God is going to win this battle and God is going to come out on high. God has already won all victory and he is waiting for his trophy. And what I'm telling you this morning, that you, on one side, you can joy with him or either you can be the product of those who, leave, who lose, but you'll still be a part of that glory of Almighty God. God says, I will be glorified. I'll be glorified in the nations, the heathen, and I will be exalted among the earth, and I'm going to be exalted among my people. Here, verse 11, for those who will glory with God, 
I want to glory with God, not glory against God. In other words, I want to see God glory in my life because I'm saved. I don't want to become the product of the loser and him be glorified through my life. Do you see that God's going to be glorified in people's salvation? He's glorified in that. But he's also going to be glorified in people's eternal damnation. Because the holy God came and provided and gave the way of salvation. And for those who would not receive him, he's even going to be glorified when people die and go to the devil's hell for all of eternity. Boy, you say, that's harsh. No, that's God's goodness that he offered them salvation. And God is glorified even when people rejected him. Friend, I want to ask you this morning, is God going to be glorified in your salvation or is God going to be glorified in your eternal damnation? Is God going to be glorified because you lived a life faithful to him or is God going to be glorified in the fact that you never participated in anything religious activity towards God because God is going to be exalted in all. Can I just tell you this morning, God's going to be exalted. Can I tell you this morning, just slow down. The verse, in verse 10, it says, slow down. In that verse, we learn and understand that the presence of the Lord brings calmness in the midst of storms. The presence of the Lord brings calmness in the midst of storms. You see, God saves us, and the Bible teaches us that He never leaves us nor forsakes us. We're going through trials and troubles. How many of y'all, what was it, last year or the year before when everybody's uh, taxes went up in Horry County? Everybody was affected by that, weren't they? Now, it affected some worse than others, but everybody that owned uh, uh, land in Horry County, they were affected by that. That was a trial for everybody. But, friend, I want you to understand there are individual trials that we'll go through where, where no one else does, and there are trials that everybody's going to go through. We've got trouble coming in our days. The question is, will you be on God's side in the midst of this? Even for those who are saved, you can't lose your salvation. You're sealed to the day of redemption. But let me ask you, if you're not faithful to God, do you have God's immediate help in time of trouble? You see, God is always with us and God is always for us. And all, God is going to take everything in our life and He's going to use it for a greater good. But what we need and what I need in life is when I get into trouble, when my taxes go up, when, uh, when I have some sickness, when I have some destruction in my family, and there are families that go through all kinds of things and, and suffering and trials and troubles in life. Friend, I want to ask you today, is God going to be an immediate assistance to you because you're being faithful to Him? Now, you can't lose your salvation, but can I tell you that Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30 says, Grieve not the Spirit of God, wherein by your seal to the day of redemption. Grieve not the Spirit of God. You understand that even though we're saved, God will never leave us nor forsake us, that we don't have the immediate blessing of God in our life when we're not faithful to Him. You see, in some way, it is mandated that because our blessing through God, He's always there and He's going to be exalted through us, if we're going to have that immediate help and assistance in a positive way of God in our situations, we should be faithful to Him. Now, there's a lot of ways we can be faithful. We can be faithful to church attendance. We can be faithful in our daily devotion life. We can be faithful in our giving. We can be faithful to God in all things that He asks. And we're not talking about a work salvation. We're talking about working and staying in fellowship with Almighty God after salvation. The storms of life will be troubling enough without God. Friend, I need God. I want God with me. I want to be on the right favor with God. I need God's help and you need God's help because we're going to go through troubles in life. Can I just say again, the presence of the Lord brings calmness in the midst of storms. If you're not saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, you don't have the promise of God's blessing through your trials and sufferings. God loves you. He loved the world so much that He gave His only begotten Son. God loves every individual. Uh, but just because God loves you and has extended grace to you in the offer of salvation, if you are not saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, God will not be gloried in your fellowship with Him. God will be glorified in your disassociation of Him. Friend, we need God. And I tell you, friend, we're going to go through trials. The world goes through trials. The lost go through trials. The saved go through trials. And we need God's help. God is going to be glorified through our trials. I want to be on His side not on the opposing side. We see in uh, uh, verse uh, 46, verse 10, chapter 46, verse 10, what it say? Be still. What does that mean? I, I titled it slow down, country boy uh, language. Slow down. But be still, if you really look at it, means to let go. Let go. Be still. Let go. 
of your troubles. Let go of your trials. I'm reminded of my favorite song in all of the secular world. Now, not the biblical world, but in the secular world. My favorite song in all of the world would come from a Disney movie. I'm not, uh, I'm not advocating for Disney, but uh, it is from a Disney movie, Frozen. Does anybody sing Frozen? That's a great movie. Y'all, y'all are... Y'all don't believe in going to the movie theaters, do you? I'm sorry. I apologize. I'm, I'm an unrighteous preacher. But I love the movie Frozen, and the reason I like Frozen, I like the, the movie and the characters, but I like the number one song in that movie that says, Let It Go. It goes something like this. Could I sing it this morning? Let it go, let it go. I can't hold it back anymore. And if I was at the house, I'd spin like this right here and do a little number, but... I don't know if you can do that in a Baptist church. I hope that was all right. I, for those that are, I'm not super spiritual. I'm sorry this morning, but uh, around the house, if you could see me do that, it would be grand and glorious to all of you, I'm sure. But uh, let it go is what he's saying here. Be still. Let it go. The troubles in life, the trials in life, because if you know, verse 11, that you are on God's side and God is on your side and God is with you, that even though the trial is hard and even though there's some suffering that goes on, that God is ultimately going to be exalted in all of the world and exalted in your troubles. It says, be still in verse 10. It means to let it go. What does it also say in verse 10? It says uh, there, and no, be still. And know that I am God. To know, what is it saying? It means have confidence in the Lord. Having an attitude of faith that even in the midst of this struggle, in the midst of this trial, there's trials that come through pretty quick and we do pretty good with those, don't, don't we? But what about those trials that last for a couple of years? Man, uh, I don't do too good in those trials. I do good for a while. Oh, I can, uh, I've preached Psalms 37, what, five times here the past year and a half, haven't I? Because I'm going through some trials too and been through some trials. I've preached that verse and preached that verse. Boy, get excited. I remember one message that I preached uh, uh, out of uh, 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 Jacob. Uh, uh, Lord, let my butler remember me. Uh, on uh, uh, Joseph. Lord, let my butler remember me. I'd pray that verse. I preached that verse. I'm still saying, oh God, please let my butler remember me. <laughs> The voices are getting dimmer and dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. Almost coming to the point and sometimes that I just kind of quit praying about something. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of you wear yourself out. Have y'all ever been there? Now don't get all tangled up in my problems now. Y'all don't have to start shedding tears for me this morning. I was using myself as an illustration because I know y'all don't want me to use you as an illustration, right? What I'm saying is we all go through trials and we all go through troubles and those troubles aren't always immediately removed. But here in the midst of the psalmist here's trouble, God says, be still and know that I am God. Slow down, let go and have confidence in the Lord. Faith that he will bring you through it and faith that he will be exalted in the midst of your trial, in the midst of your trouble. Can I ask you a question? Was God ultimately and overall blessed and exalted through the nation Israel? Yes, he was. He was exalted when he walked them across Red Seas and mighty miracles. He was exalted when he brought them out of, out of Egypt with ten mighty supernatural plagues. And he was exalted when God came and saw Moses on the top of Mount Sinai. And he was exalted so many times. But you know what? He was exalted in the great mighty miracles and times of victory, but he was also exalted when they rebelled against him. And there were times when the wrath of God's judgment would come upon his own people. Why? Because they rejected him and they lived in rebellion and they went against him. Man was not so glorified, but God was always glorified in their highs and in their lows. Friend, they spent 40 years in the wilderness. That was a mighty trial, wasn't it? And the psalmist still would say here, he would say, be still, just slow down and let God be exalted. Friend, God is here to exalt you in your trials. He will ultimately receive uh, exaltation and glory in the midst of everything that goes on in your life. Friend, why don't you just be on His side and not on the opposing side? Because God has got some big boxing gloves and He's going to wear the devil out and He's going to KO him once He's turned loose and that buzzer goes off on, on a show night when everybody gets in the ring and it's finally time to do final business. God is going to KO that devil with one, one lick, one uppercut. In fact, that uppercut has already been delivered. It's just not been set in stone yet. The devil has lost this warfare. The devil has lost, and the lost will receive eternal damnation. The righteous will receive the eternal, eternal life that Jesus Christ has offered. You've already won, ultimately. But God says, slow down in your trials, and let him be exalted in your trials. 
When we look at this, we, we, we see that he says, Be still and to know. But in verse 1, what does he say? God is our refuge and our strength. God is our refuge and strength. Uh, too often we try to fight our own battles, don't we? Uh, too often we try to fight it in our own flesh and God has said, be still and what do we do? We get that anxiety and get to moving around and bouncing around. We, uh, we're, we're supposed to be sitting in the corner and taking a little break, but here we are prancing back and forth, worried to death about what's going on in our life and in our trial. And God said, just slow down, be still uh, and know, have faith. In God, here it says the psalmist was acknowledging that God is our refuge and He is our strength. He is the one that's going to fight the battles of this life for us. When I see verse 1 and I look at that word refuge, I think that we, one thing that we can learn today is that we need to have confidence in God's sheltering ability. We need to have confidence in God's sheltering ability. Refuge, it means a place that you go for help. It is a place of safety. It is a place uh, where even uh, the Jews, uh, even uh, in modern day Jews over in Israel, where would they go when there was missile attacks? They would go to these little bunkers that were designed in the city. And they would go because it was a place of refuge. Unfortunately, when Hamas recently attacked Israel, that they understood that the culture there would go to those places of refuge, those bomb shelters. And what they did is they waited for the Jews to come in after the missile attacks and to get in their place of refuge. And then they would go and throw grenades into the places of refuge, little small uh, buildings smaller than this one, and begin to attack the people there. Their place of refuge. I'm glad that God's got a place of refuge that the devil can't come in. The enemy can't get a hold of us. Friend, I want you to understand that he, we need to have confidence in his sheltering ability. He is a place that we can come and a place of safety for us in the midst of a world that's trying to destroy us, in the midst of a world with trials, in the midst of a world with all kinds of trouble in life. He is our place of refuge. Not only should you have confidence that in his sheltering ability, but you should have confidence in his stability. Confidence in his stability. Look at it. In the verse it says he is our refuge and he is our strength. I think about rock. All through the word our God is considered to be a, a rock a foundation, a solid place. What is a rock? It is a place where you can go for safety and the rocks you can hide behind and bullets can't hit you and darts can't come through and arrows can't pierce a rock. So it's a place, it's a wall of safety and our Lord is a place uh, of stability for us to hold us up in a world that's sinking in quicksand. He is our foundation. I think about a story that Jesus told over in Matthew chapter 7, I'll read, to, read it to you. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, Jesus said, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man. What did this wise man do? Which built his house upon a rock, upon a foundation, upon a, a solid place. Uh, and uh, the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell not. Why? Because it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon the house and it fell and great was the fall of it. What is the key factor of you surviving in this life and you exalting God and really living in victory above all of the trials of this world is going to be what you're building upon. Are you building upon the stability that is in Christ Jesus and following His Word? Or are you building your life on sinking sand? Can I tell you that the world is sinking sand? Uh, most of your friends and most of the world that's trying to influence you outside of the church world and outside of God is building on quick sand. And friend, you can either uh, lean to the rudiments of this world and build your houses upon them, but you see the same winds and the same rains and the same storms come against both the just and the unjust. The ones that follow God's command there in Matthew chapter 7 then build on a rock, their house withstood the same storms that the wicked that did not follow God the same storms destroyed those houses. You want to make it through trials? You want to make it through this life? You better build on the solid rock, Jesus Christ. We have, should have confidence in His sheltering ability. We should have confidence in His stability to hold us up, to strengthen us. That takes faith to believe that He can accomplish what He told us He would accomplish. 
Thirdly, we should have confidence in his strength. You see it in verse 1 again. What does it say? Uh, it says God is our refuge and our strength. Our strength. When I think about strength, that God is strong and that he is our strength, I think about this uh, in uh, Isaiah chapter 40 and verse uh, 31. Isaiah verse 40, verse Chapter 40, verse 31, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as evil as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. Those that what? Wait upon the Lord. Those that are patient. Those that let go and have confidence in the Lord. They will have the strength that God has. We're walking in God's strength, not our own. Us young, younger people, when I was younger, I was, felt that I was a lot more spiritual and, and able to accomplish God's will for my life because I had stamina and I had strength. But there's something about age that it begins to slow you down and you lose your own motiv motivation in life. Brother Don's laughing a little harder than some of y'all. Some of y'all are not and some of y'all are just laughing. That tells me that some of y'all have fully accomplished in your mind that you're unable to live in your own strength. And some of you young people are still trying to do it on your own, aren't you? I'm strong. I'm bad. Uh, yeah, I was there too. Uh, well, I'm not as old as some. I'm just getting to the grounds where I'm starting to feel more body parts than I used to. And I think back to some of the messages that I used to preach, and now I would, would preach in motivation. You do this and you do that and give it. To, you can do this and you can do it, but you can only do it through God's strength. Because the older we get, the easier it is to rely on God. But the younger you are, the harder it is for you to rely on God because you still want to pick up the battle. You're still strong. You don't have an aching back. There's one thing I'm not going to do when my back's are hurting. I'm not going to lift anything heavy. But when my back's not hurting, I may attempt it because I forget it's there. And young people are more willing to pick up a load that they can't pick up because... They think that they're able to do it. Frank and I just remind you this morning, young and old and middle-aged alike, that the battle is the Lord's. And you can't carry this thing. You can't defeat the battles that are before you. Do as the psalmist says here and have confidence in the strength of the Lord. Not only having confidence in the shelter and the ability of God, the stability of God, and the strength of God, but have confidence in His presence. Have confidence in His presence. Look at verse 1 again. God is our refuge and strength. A very what? A very present. A very present help in time of trouble. You see, God was with the psalmist and he understood that. He had the faith. He knew that God was with him in the midst of the trial. And he understood that God would be exalted even at the end of the trial because God was the one that was going to fight the victory. The psalmist had already come to the point that he had tried to work through his financial problems. The psalmist had already come to the point that he was trying to work through, uh, tired of trying to work through his uh, health problems. He was tired of trying to fix his family problems. He was tired of trying to fix his girlfriend or his boyfriend problems or his spouse's problems and he had come to the point that he had finally whatever this major task was that was before him in his life he had finally come to the point and said I can't do it but God can he is my refuge he is my strength he is the one that is an ever what present help in time of trouble are you glad that God is a present God that you're not fighting by yourself oh the devil in the midst of trials what's the first thing that he does you're all by yourself no one else is having this problem. No one else cares about you and he isolates you to the point that you're all by yourself and the devil tries to make you think that God doesn't care about you and God doesn't love you because he's allowed this problem to come in your life. Well, the reason that God has allowed any problem to come in your life is for his own glory and exaltation. Job went through such great troubles and trials and Job didn't even realize and understand He even said at times, Oh God, just kill me and put me out of my misery. Where have I gone against you? I've tried to be righteous. I've tried to do right. And Job never sinned. But I'm going to tell you what, I see some, some human uh, tendencies in Job that I see in myself and I see in others when they go through trials is that they become isolated. And Job, even in his uh, perfectness, he even had some speech of ending things, didn't he? Take me out. That's the first thing when tri life gets really bad. What do you think? Oh, God, why don't you just come get me? And you can tell when you're getting in a pretty deep trial and you're getting in a pretty bad state because what you'll begin to say is, oh God, why don't you just come get me and get me out of here? Because when you're in a healthy state and you're in a 
a faith, a moment of faith when you're really believing in God, all you can see is the goodness of God and you can see the future and you can see life. When you begin to see death, can I just tell you, or ending things or just the end of the trial and the end of this, can I just tell you that that's the devil that's speaking in your life? Can I just help you to understand this morning that we need to have confidence in the presence of the Lord, that God is with you in the darkest times of your life and He's with you in the brightest times of your life. I think about Psalms 23, and I think specifically about verse 24. Oh, Psalms 23, we all love it. But Psalms 23 and verse 24, what does it say? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art, what is it? You're with me. You're with me. Uh, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. What is he saying? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, oh, we could look at the, the death and, and the tragedies, but if you really look at what was going on in the context of that verse, if you were to go over to Israel and you were looking at the valley of the shadow of death, oh, that's a, a deep valley. If you were to slip, you're a goner. And here these sheep would walk down little five-inch paths about that, that wide, and they would walk that same path all curvy, and they were with their shepherd. And one little slip, even though they walked through the valley of the shadow of death, they're at the point of, of falling off and, and, and going into uh, death and, and being harmed and being hurt. Even the slip on this path would be hurt. But what did the psalmist say? He said, Thou art with me. He had a shepherd that was guarding him, a shepherd that as this sheep would go uh, through life, there were wolves, there were animals that were trying to take them. The environment was about to take them half the time. Sheep weren't even smart enough to find their own grass. They had to be led to the pastures. But here God was an ever-present help in the sheep's time of trouble. Can I tell you that in Psalms 23 is a picture of the Christian, the God believer, that God is our shepherd taking care of us. He's present with you in the midst of your storms. And he'll always be present with you in the midst of the storms. The question is, are you present with him? You see, even though He's with us, sometimes our faith and our mind just begins to wander from the temptation of the devil and the trials overwhelm us and the troubles come against us. And many times God is present with us, but we're not present with God, what? In faith and in thinking because we've allowed the devil to enter into our mind and to tell us that we're isolated. Nobody loves us. Frank, can I tell you that there's nothing further from the truth for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him he could be with them and present with them in every trial, in every trouble, in every circumstance in life. In the verse, we understand that the presence of the Lord brings calmness in the midst of storms. The storms are not only just physical storms and things that come in life. We could name all kinds of things. Troubles. Marriage can bring us troubles. Uh, uh, life can bring us troubles. Our job can bring us troubles. Our kids can bring us troubles. Uh, when they stray away and they go in the wrong direction of what we want. So many things that we can go through, but also we can uh, complicate this exaltation that God is also going to be uh, exalted in the storms that are even within nature, not just in our lives, but the storms that are within, in, within nature. You see that in verses 2 through 7. Verse 2, therefore, will we not fear? Uh, we won't fear though the earth be removed, even though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Though the waters thereof roar and be troubled through the mountain shake, though the mountain shake with the uh, swelling thereof. What do we see here? We're even seeing that God is going to be exalted not only in the troubles in our lives, but God is going to be exalted what? In the earth, as it said in Psalms 46 verse 10. I will be exalted in the heathen or the nations and I will be exalted in the earth. Can I tell you Psalms 19, what say? The heavens declare the glory of God. Psalms 19, verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. Friend, I want you to understand today that God is even being exalted in nature. He's being exalted this morning in the rain. He's being exalted in the cold. He's being exalted in the summertime. He's being exalted by all things in nature, and God is not nature, but He is over nature. He has created nature, and just as the... the creator, the painter of a picture, you see his own attributes in it. And you see, and it can only glorify the painter through the picture or the portrait that he's painted. God is seen all through creations. You see his handiwork all over it. 
And here the psalmist is even pointing to, it doesn't matter what storm come, it doesn't matter, Matthew 5, Matthew chapter 7 that we read, verse 24, when the rains and the storms come in life, even the natural disasters in life, that God is being exalted through all of that. It's hard to understand how uh, tornadoes can come and how this cursed world that people are killed by natural disasters, but even in the midst of all of these things, God is ultimately exalted. We see the storms of nature. Not only that, but we could look to Revelation 6, and I can read that to you. Uh, Revelation 6, we see a likeness in the wrath of God that's coming upon the world one day. In Revelation 6, verse 6 through 12, And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts saying, uh, measure of wheat. Look at verse 12, chapter 6, verse 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth and hair, hair, and the moon became as blood. Verse 13, and the stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree cast of her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Verse 14, And the heaven departed as a scroll when it rolled together, and every mountain and, uh, and island were removed out of their places. We're seeing here natural disasters in the world. And the kings, verse 15, of the earth, of the, and great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, what's, what's going to be the response of these lost pagans? And every bondman and every free man, what do they do? They hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Those that are against God, God is having victory here, isn't he? And he's doing that through natural disaster. This is during the great tribulation. I'm glad that by, because I'm saved by the blood of Jesus, I won't be there. I will have been raptured out with the church of God. But here the natural disasters that are going to be a symbol of the wrath of God on those who had rejected him. Friend, I want you to understand today that God's receiving glory through all of the things that go on in life, through the moon, through the stars, through the mountains, through the storms, through the rain through the wind even when people are destroyed by that God is going to be glorified in it and that time of great tribulation is not necessarily the devil having his way on earth but it is the wrath of God with all of God's grace being removed and it's coming against the world in those seven years <coughs> I'm glad that God in God's presence that not even the natural disasters and storms I don't have to be worried about those because God is going to be exalted in it all Storms of nature, but also in verses 8 through 11, we see the storms of the nations. Verse 8, Come, behold the work of the Lord, what desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He's bringing peace. He breaketh the bow, a sign of peace. And he cutteth the spear in sunder, a sign of peace. He burneth the chariots in the fire. What do we see here? That God is the peacemaker. God is the ultimate one who will bring all, uh, all glory unto himself and will attain ultimate victory. There'll be a day one day when man will no longer fight wars. Why? Because God will have proven himself the ultimate authority. There will be a day when man won't be in these scuffles and these scuffles of responsibility and accountability and trying to be presidents and trying to rule the world because God will set himself up and show to all, no need for you to fight because you can't beat me. He'll sit in his, he sits in his place of authority now. But one day even the world will completely yield and submit to him and he'll be exalted through the storms of the nations. Very quickly, uh, we look even now the next event on God's calendar is that the church would be raptured out. But coming very quickly after that would be the battle of what's called Gog and Magog. You could understand it in Daniel and Ezekiel. The war of Gog and Magog, everything's in place for that war. If you were to look at that and read all of the, the, the names and study the, the historical names on that, that it would be Russia, it would be China, uh, it would be uh, Iran. You see, all of these people are in place right now trying to come against Israel right now, aren't they? And the war of Gog and Magog will be a battle where they will come and they will attack Israel, but God will protect them. 
Uh, what I'm trying to tell you is that it's soon and very soon the end of this world. Do we know how soon it will be? But I, can, I can't tell you that. I can't promise you that the war of Gog and Magog is coming this year or next year. But I can tell you this. It sure looks pretty good to me. Things are coming into place. And we've been blessed to see the glory of God in it. Not only that, thinking of warfare, but there'll be a war toward the end of the tribulation period. At the end of, uh, of that seven years, there'll be a thousand-year a thousand millennial reign. And what will happen at the end of that thousand years, Satan will be turned loose and he'll build a, a, another army to come against God and try to overtake God. Are you serious? This joker's, I mean, he's, he's just in his mind, he's, he's a crazy devil, isn't he? Because even in the end, he still thinks he can overtake God. And he will take an army and he will come against and there will be a mighty warfare. It's called the Battle of Armageddon. Have you ever heard of that? But even in the midst of that war, mighty wars, who becomes victorious? God. He reigns on high. Friend, I want to tell you today that your little problems are nothing in the size of what God can deal with. And he will be exalted in the nations and he will be exalted in the earth. And he will be exalted in your little teeny scuffles and trials. They're big to you, but they're small to God. And he is an ever-present help in time of trouble. He will be exalted. In fact, Philippians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10 says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Jesus Christ, the Lord. Even those who rejected Christ on this side, they'll one day kneel at judgment and they will acknowledge him at Christ. Friend, here's the important thing is that you acknowledge him now rather than later. Acknowledge him now in your life. Acknowledge that you need him. You can't, you can't, you can't make it through this life on your own. You can, you can, listen, you can listen to motivational speakers, and that's good. I hope you do. I need positivity in my life. But, friend, it's going to take more than you. It's going to take the strength and the refuge, verse 1, of Almighty God in your life to bring you through the trials that you're going to face. Some of you young people, y'all don't even have a clue what you're going to face yet. Y'all are still creating havoc in your lives. You young people, y'all are creating havoc in your lives that that seed won't manifest right now, but it's going to manifest in two, three, four, five, maybe 10 years, 20 years. And the things and the seeds that you're planting now are going to be the great trials that you'll one day face if you're not careful and follow God. There's going to be things that are not self-inflicted, but there'll be things that other people are going to do that, that are going to cause you great havoc in your life seems like in youth and young when you're young you can you can hide these thoughts and you can put things behind you in busyness but as you get older and slower then you've got to face some things that happen in life it's a constant thing with the military men who have been had ptsd they went through great combat and things of such a lot of those war vet, those uh, uh vietnam veterans they were good for many years, but as they got older, then they had to start to deal with the things that were done many moons ago. And friend, what I want to tell you today is that there's trials that are self-inflicted. There are trials that will be inflicted on you by others. There's just as common trials of all of mankind that reigns on the just and the unjust. We're going to have bad presidents. We're going to have high taxes. And then there are those individual trials of sickness and troubles that come at us in life. And the only way that we're going to make it through in victory is be on the side and in the corner of the victorious one, our Lord Jesus Christ, and God his Father. He will be exalted among the nations. He will be exalted among the earth. And he can be exalted in your life as you just slow down, be still, and know that he is God. Every head bowed, every eye closed as we come to a time of altar call. If we were to look across this congregation, no doubt, there's troubles, there's trials, there's problems. Whether they're here now, there will be. If we would look into the, some kind of time warp and see the things that we go through, I think it would scare us to death. But the thing that the psalmist is trying to tell us is that God had brought him through a mighty trial and he was looking in faith for him to bring him through all trials. Can I remind you, God will be exalted in your life and through your troubles. And this morning, the thing that you need to do is just simply slow down and rest in the Lord. Get in his corner 
Quit li letting life beat you up. Quit worrying to death of how you're going to fix something. Place attention to that. But first of all, place attention to the Scriptures, to God's direction in your life, and to pray, and let God move in your life. Maybe you're here today and you're in a storm and you're in a trial and life's hitting you hard. Can I just remind you? I can't think of a better thing to do than just come down to an old altar today and give that to God. You know what that looks like? Come down to an altar and pray and it looks like what this psalmist is doing right here. Acknowledging God and publicly writing down in the scriptures that he's going to yield to God Almighty. You know, it'd be a good thing to do for some people today. Maybe come down to an altar and just publicly say, you know what? I might not be going through a trial, but I know I will. But I'm just going to put God at the forefront and say that I'm trusting publicly in God to bring me through this life and to be exalted in my life. This altar is open for you this morning. Maybe there's someone here. You've never truly been saved by the blood of Jesus. Maybe you've been religious. Maybe you've been brought up in a religious family. But you've never really truly trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. Can I tell you this morning that God said that if you would confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, if you would believe in your heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, you shall be saved. Friend, you need to be saved this morning. Maybe you're here this morning and you know life circumstances are coming, but you've been in the wrong corner. You've been living to yourself in the world rather than living for God. Friend, can I tell you this morning, would you just yield yourself to God? God's not mad at you. No one's disappointed in you. But what you need this morning is you just need to start right now. You need to get out of the devil's corner and walk right on over to God's corner and sit down and side with Him and fight with Him and live with Him. You just need to change corners and God will receive you. He said in His Word, Any man that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Friend, this morning God loves you. He's not disappointed in you. Come on over to His side and allow Him victory in your surrender to Him rather than your rejection to Him. Father, we thank You this morning for all of Your blessings, Your mercy, Your grace. God, may You move in this congregation. May You help us. God, we need You and we need an ever-present help in time of trouble. For the troubles are many today. The battle's hard. The world, the flesh, and the devil nearly destroy us sometimes. But God, may you help us, strengthen us, empower us through this season, Lord, that we would just slow down and acknowledge you. Father, we love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand and sing, would you be obedient this morning?